Hi everyone, this is Libby, and today we are going to start a new series, and it is an extremely important series. Uh, it is highly discussed and somewhat debated greatly, and um, I hope through us breaking bread together we can bring more clarity and we each can learn some new things, because I know we're all at different points on our journey. Some are new believers, some are seasoned believers, and so we need to give grace to one another at whatever point we are walking on. And also, we should take every study and everything that we learn or listen to, we need to bring it before God, Yahuwah, and ask Him to lead and guide us to all truth through the Ruach HaKadosh, because people simply can make errors. That's why we always take everything to Him and let His Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, have the final say. So with that being said, let's enjoy, let's let's break bread together and let's take this journey and, and, and see it through. Don't just start and stop, let's see it through because this topic has so many tentacles, if you will. It's not that it's complicated, it's actually very beautiful, but it's like putting together a puzzle one piece at a time. It takes time to put together a puzzle. So take time and sit at his feet and listen to what he's speaking, um, how he's speaking directly to you. So today we're going to delve into the topic of the two priesthoods. This will be an introduction only. We will be focused on the Melchizedek priesthood and the Aaronic Levitical priesthood and eventually get into discussion of the Book of the Covenant and the Book of the Law and how all this impacts us. Now this timeline we will use a lot through this study and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this timeline right now, but I do want you to see it. I want you to become familiar with it because we will eventually get into much detail that's on this timeline. So for now, let's just uh, be aware that the priesthoods ran parallel in either an elevated or denigrated position. We see from Genesis to the point of the sin of the golden calf, the preachers of righteousness, the Melchizedek priesthood reigned. It was the righteous lineage of Yahusha. Then, at the time of the sin of the golden calf, was when they broke their marriage covenant, the book of the covenant, with God, and he was ready to wipe them out. A matter of fact, 3,000 did die, but because Moses interceded for them, he spared the rest of their lives and implemented implemented the book of the law. They didn't really have a say. <laughs> they wanted to live, they would do this book of the law. And the Aaronic Levitical priesthood, they were assigned to carrying the book of the law out. And at that time, the Melchizedek priesthood was in a denigrated role as they um, implemented this book of the law until Jesus, Yahusha, would come. So at that time, then, Yahusha HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, he brought back the Melchizedek priesthood to the reigning position once and for all, for eternity, and he has taken his seat at the right hand of the Father. And through the Melchizedek priesthood, he has made a way for us to be a kingdom of priests, plural, from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, as we read about in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, and in other areas which we will review. So there was not going to be a way that we could be a kingdom of priests under the Aaronic Levitical priesthood. No, because you had to be from the tribe of Levi. But Yahusha ushered in once and for all the Melchizedek priesthood to the reigning position, which it started out with the preachers of righteousness, the Melchizedek priesthood. Again, it was denigrated during the time of the implementation of the Book of the Law until Yahushua could come. Then he once again elevated it 
to a reigning position for eternity. Praise Yah. And now he has made us once again a kingdom of priests and not just a kingdom with a priest. So the tribe of Levi was extremely important during this time period. So don't, don't get me wrong. And the tribe of Levi, I'm sure, will continue to play a very important role under the Melchizedek priesthood because it's, um, Jesus has made a way for every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, including the tribe of Levi. What all of our roles will be, that remains to be seen. So anyway, just um, see this timeline for now as a visual representation of what priesthood started, how the Aaronic Levitical priesthood was implemented, how the Melchizedek priesthood was denigrated, though it continued um, uh, in a denigrated position until the time of Yahusha, because the uh, righteous lineage came through the Melchizedek priesthood, preachers of righteousness, that Yahushua would descend from. So just keep that picture in mind. So we will study how the Book of the Covenant was our marriage covenant. We will discuss the difference between a blood ratified covenant, which requires a proposal, an acceptance, blood ratification and a covenant confirming meal and a blood ratified covenant you cannot add to it or take away from it so understand that about a blood ratified covenant which was like the new covenant that Yahushua HaMashiach Jesus the Messiah brought in he too has proposed to the world we know in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so people can choose to accept that or reject that. And he blood ratified it with his own precious blood, the blood of the Lamb. And he provided us a covenant confirming meal through the bread and the wine in remembrance of, of him. So, again, this timeline, we will go into more detail as we proceed in this study. Hebrews 7.11 tells us, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should, should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? And on to Hebrews 7.12, it says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So that change that they're talking about is that elevation and denigration position. What priesthood was reigning at the time? Now, just to take a quick snapshot of what's going on and the differences between these priesthoods and how it, it directly affects us, uh, I found this little chart and we'll go over it just as a quick comparison. So we have the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. The Levitical priesthood, though very, very important, it was imperfect. It was temporary. It was an old order, insufficient, deficient, earthly, imperfect. The priest is a sinner. Under sentence of death was from the tribe of Levi, cannot reconcile man to God, cannot represent God to man, cannot remove the sin barrier, cannot bring man to perfection under condemnation of the law. With Yahushua HaMashiach ushering in the final reigning Melchizedek priesthood, it is the perfect priesthood. It is eternal. It is the final reigning priesthood. It's sufficient. It's the model priesthood. It's royal, heavenly, perfect mediator. This priest is sinless because he is our high priest, our Kohen Hagendal. Broke the power of death from the tribe of Judah. Can, can reconcile man to God, Yahuwah. Can represent God to man. Can remove the sin barrier. Can bring man to perfection. Fulfilled the requirements of the law. And he was the only one that could fulfill the requirements of the law. 
So what priesthood was in place when Yahushua, Jesus, was born? Have you ever thought about that? He was born and lived during the time of the Aaronic Levitical priesthood under the law, the book of the law, through the system though i'm sorry though the system had become corrupt in galatians 4 4 we read but when the time had fully come god sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive our adoption as sons we will see that the ironic levitical priesthood was put in place to serve yahuwah and implement the imposed book of the law not blood ratified imposed book of the law this is the law mentioned in galatians 4 and dates back to the sin of the golden calf the ironic levitical priesthood and the book of the law go hand in hand this required the earthly tabernacle temple system many uh, animals were sacrificed physical circumcision and these were all types and shadows of his kingdom and high priest of the melchizedek order to come through yahushua hamashiach jesus the messiah we see in this picture, ultimately, this final transition period, this final point of tension between the, the Levitical priesthood faced off with the, the final ruling, reigning, kingly, priestly role of Yehusha HaMashiach as our Kohen Hagendal. So th there was tension here. There was a lot of resistance here. There was a power struggle here. There was a um, land struggle here. There, there were so many things coming head to head at this point. It was a major shift. Galatians 3.19 says, Why then was the law given? That, and it is also answered in Galatians 3.19. It was added because of the transgressions when until the seed the seed being jesus the messiah yahushua hamashiach to whom the promise was made would come the law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator so what priesthood did yahushua jesus die under have you ever thought about that i think most have not He died under the Melchizedek priesthood that he himself ushered back into the reigning position as our Kohen Hagen Dahl, our high priest of the Melchizedek order. He was the high priest over his own crucifixion. Get your head wrapped around that. He was the high priest over his own crucifixion death and resurrection as he ascended to heaven and offered his blood once and for all on yahuwah's heavenly altar and we will get into the details even of how all that transpired details that you probably have not consider considered before in psalm 110 we read in verse 4 the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Sometimes you will hear it pronounced Melchizedek. Luke 17, 21 tells us, Neither will they say, Look here or look there. For behold, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Yahuwah, is within you. This was miraculous that he sent us the Comforter. And the Comforter, the, the Holy Spirit, lives in us and through us. We are his temple now. And this is just amazing. So Romans 14, 7 says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness. It is peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Yahuwah. So through Yahushua, through Jesus, we are saved by grace through faith.
Ephesians 2 8 reads, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, Yahuwah, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, Messiah Yahusha, to do good works, which God, Yahuwah, prepared in advance as our way of life. The book of Acts, after Pentecost, propelled the disciples and later Paul into this last major mega transition. This was the last change back to the Melchizedek priesthood, that elevation, that reigning position once and for all. Stephen gives a beautiful oration in Acts chapter 7 before the Sanhedrin. It actually covers an entire Melchizedek covenant confirming gospel message. <laughs> it is truly amazing. So well articulated. Just read Acts 7. And again, it is important to determine the time in history history, and what priesthood was in place. So we looked at that timeline and we looked at it throughout history from Genesis to Revelation. We saw what priesthood began through the preachers of righteousness, Melchizedek priesthood. And recall then the implementation of the book of the law with the Aaronic Levitical priesthood until Yahushua HaMashiach would again bring that Melchizedek priesthood, that kingly, priestly um, role back into the reigning position. So it is extremely important to determine the time in history and what priesthood was in place, just like we did with Jesus, Yahusha. He was born under the book of the law. However, he, he ushered in the reigning Melchizedek priesthood for the final time through laying down his life and shedding his blood once and for all. And so, so it's important to, again, look at a, that timeline and see what history you are talking about in God's word and what priesthood were they under and what law were they under? That's always a great starting point to, to um, see what laws they were under. So Paul also was born under the law. He was born under the Aaronic Levitical priesthood system. After the stoning of Stephen on the road to Damascus, we know Paul is saved by grace through faith and was a chosen vessel by Yahushua, Jesus, for this pivotal time of the transition between priesthoods and laws. And there was no better person that could implement this because he was very well learned. He was taught under Gamaliel and he, was, he knew God's word like the back of his hand. And again, when Stephen um, was brought before the Sanhedrin, the covenant confirming Melchizedek gospel message was vehemently attacked as it is to this very day. And again, why? Because man wants to control the power and the message. Also because truth is always attacked first. So it was not easy for the followers, the believers, the disciples to usher in and carry out this major transition. There was a lot of teaching to be done. To this very day, there's a lot of teaching to be done. And that is one reason, one major reason, why I wanted us to come together and study together and search out the scriptures and connect the dots and see if these things be so. Don't take my word for it. Always take it to his word and ask the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, to lead and guide you to all truth. That's the only way. In Philippians 3, we read, For the rest, my brothers, rejoice in Yahuwah, God, the Lord God. To write the same manner, matters to you is truly no trouble to me. So he repeated his 
his explanations over and over again until it was understood. It's not difficult, it's just a lot to take in and a lot to get your head wrapped around, if you will. So he said, and he wrote, to write the same matters to you is truly no trouble to me, and for you it is safe. Look out for dogs, look out for the evil workers, look out for the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who are serving Elohim in the spirit. So who are the circumcision? For we are the circumcision who are serving Elohim in the spirit and boasting in Messiah Yahusha and do not trust in the flesh, though I too might have trust in the flesh. If anyone else thinks to trust in the flesh, I more, he said. Circumcise the eighth day of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, according to Torah, a Pharisee, according to ardor or zeal, persecuting the assembly, according to righteousness that is in the law, having become blameless. But what might have been a gain to me, I have counted as loss because of Messiah. So Paul continues to explain this major and final transition back to the Melchizedek priesthood. Righteousness by grace through faith in and through Messiah Yahusha and not by the law. In Galatians 3, 12, through 14 we read the law however is not based on faith on the contrary the one who does these things will live by them Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree he redeemed us so that the blessing promised to Abraham would come to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the spirit so what time period did Abraham live under Abraham lived during the time of the preachers of righteousness the Melchizedek priesthood these were the ones that Yahweh the Lord God would mediate through to the people there were laws of right living sacrifices between uh, Yahweh and man right eating uh, knowing the clean and unclean knowledge, as did Noah in his day, there was already covenant marriage. There was um, uh, commandments about the species staying with like kinds and not mixing. There was also grace and the keeping of his Moedim, which are called his appointed times or sometimes referred to as re his rehearsals or feasts. These are the times throughout the year we should meet with our coming groom these these are the bridal rehearsals to know about our groom so in genesis 12 verse 6 we read abram believed the lord yahweh and it was credited credited to him as righteousness so by faith Abram believed Yahuwah. So we know Noah was a preacher of righteousness and a select few preserved through the flood. The flood wiped out the majority of corrupted flesh. And we will look at this term preacher of righteousness in his word just so you'll know that I'm just not pulling it out of thin air. The promise to Abraham was unconditional in Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3. He does ask for a guarantee later on in Genesis 15, but the initial promise was unconditional and, and that's extremely important because we benefit greatly, greatly um, uh, by that promise to Abraham. And then in Genesis 14:18. We will look at in more detail after the Battle of the Kings how uh, Melchizedek or Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine and he blessed Abram. Now he was a priest of Yahuwah Most High. So he was a king and he was a priest. 
So again, we know Noah was a preacher of righteousness because it's recorded in 2 Peter 2, verse 5, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, among the eight. <clears throat> among the eight. So here is a term, preacher of righteousness, that identifies Noah as one of the preachers of righteousness. Again, the promise was made to Abram in Genesis 12, verse 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And in Genesis 14 records when the king, when the Melchizedek king of Salem brought out bread and wine since he was priest of God most high and he blessed abram and said blessed be abram by god most high creator of heaven and earth and again we'll go into these time periods in more detail as we continue this study now i want to give you a snapshot of the melchizedek priesthood predating the implementation of the erotic levitical priesthood so we just defined Noah as a preacher of righteousness, and then it descended through Shem all the way down to Abraham, and then all the way through and down to uh, Joseph. And we know off the chart, eventually Moses was called by God, and he also was a Melchi he was a preacher of righteousness under the Melchizedek priesthood. So before Noah, let's take a look. And see, Noah was here. So before Noah, we see Adam, we see Seth, we see Methuselah. And this is taken from Hebrew for Christians. Let's read it together. Adam was the world's firstborn son of God. Genesis 2, 7, Luke 3, 38. After his... After his transgression and exile from the garden, Adam built an altar and offered sacrifices to the Lord as humanity's first high priest. When he later died, Adam's son, Seth, became high priest in his place. When Seth later died, the priesthood went to Methuselah, who served for centuries. Methuselah was prophesied to die seven days before the advent of the great flood, and upon his death his grandson Noah was commissioned to be humanity's high priest. Noah had learned the laws of sacrifice, clean and unclean, from the books of Adam and Enoch as well as from his grandfather. Genesis 8 verse 20 after the flood, Noah rebuilt Adam's original altar in Jerusalem, which had been destroyed earlier by wicked people of the generation of the flood. So I just wanted to kind of give you an idea and, and, and that connection with these names of those serving in the role of preachers of righteousness of the Melchizedek order. And again, we will get into more detail. Why is understanding the priesthoods of the Bible important? We read in Hebrews 7.12, For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For example, think about a current presidential election. When a newly elected president um, is on the scene, comes a change in cabinet members along with executive orders and legislative changes. During the presidential term in that associated historical time period, the people are affected by those changes. So again, Hebrews 7.12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. What change of law is Hebrews 7 speaking of? So Hebrews 7.12 tells us that when the priesthood changes, so does the law change. We will soon discuss in upcoming sessions how the law changed. It's very important. Now, you may ask, well, how many changes in priesthoods were there? 
So keep in mind, with each change of priesthood comes a change in the law. Remember, we just read that in Hebrews 7.11. So I listed four, four points. First being, though we see the role of priests started with Adam, as we saw on that uh, genealogy chart, the first use of the word priest was used in Genesis 14 to identify Melchizedek or Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God, Yahweh. The title Preachers of Righteousness also refers to the royal lineage ultimately leading to Jesus, Yahusha, as referenced in 2 Peter 2.5. The Aaronic Levitical priesthood was not implemented until after the sin of the golden calf, and we will provide more supporting um, scripture for that. Thirdly, so just between the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus, we see a change in priesthoods, and instead of them being a kingdom of priests, plural, they would become a kingdom with the priests through the Aaronic Levitical priesthood. That was... Um, Yah's permissive will that was not his perfect will. Fourthly, the last reigning priesthood recorded in the Bible is the Melchizedek priesthood with Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, as our high priest who made full atonement for our sins once and for all. The Melchizedek priesthood with our Kohen Hagendal, our high priest, is ruling and reigning forever and ever let it be so. So back to this reference scripture in 2 Peter 2.5, again, was showing how the term preacher of righteousness identified Noah. In Deuteronomy 9.15, Moses is um, saying to the people, so I went back down the mountain while it was blazing with fire with the two tablets of the covenant in my hands. And I saw how you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way the Lord had commanded you. They only lasted about 40 days under the, the marriage covenant that they agreed to. So verse 17, so I took hold of the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, shattering them before your eyes. And it was at this point that the added imposed book of the law was implemented by this point number two under the Aaronic Levitical priesthood. Let's read a little bit more detail in this, not only from Deuteronomy chapter 9 in between these verses, which we read a few of those verses just then, but this is now in Exodus 32. Now, keep in mind, in Exodus 24, the Book of the Covenant had been written out on a parchment scroll and read to the people. So the proposal was given to the people. They accepted. Moses did a blood ratification of that um, scroll and upon the people, and it was followed by a covenant-confirming meal in Exodus 24:11. Once a covenant is blood ratified, you cannot add anything to it. So the book of the law is separate, and we will see how separate it is. Now, when the people saw that Moses was delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. So Aaron told them, Take off the gold earrings that are on your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. Then all the people took off their gold earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from their hands and with an engraving tool he fashioned it into a molten calf and they said O Israel these are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt when Aaron saw this he built an altar before the calf and proclaimed tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord so the next day they arose 
offered burnt offerings and presented peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry then the lord said to moses go down at once for your people whom you brought up out of the land of egypt have corrupted themselves we know that he had left aaron in charge how quickly they have turned aside from the way i commanded them they have made for themselves a molten calf and have bowed down to it sacrificed to it and said o israel this is your god who brought you up out of the land of egypt so it's pretty clear how they broke the covenant and we shouldn't be very critical of the israelites because they they had come out of egypt but they were blending uh, profanity with the purity of worshiping the one true elohim yahuwah and to this very day the traditional and emergent churches are and have been blending pagan feast days holy days no, i'm sorry pagan holidays excuse me um and celebrating them as if they are celebrating to the one true elohim yahuwah but that couldn't be further from the truth because the time period that we observe as christmas december 25th is actually um, the celebration of the birth of tammuz and then if you come to the holiday of Easter is actually a holiday man-made tradition celebrating Ishtar so the you can even hear the sound Ishtar Easter and it was the fertility goddess worship so so this blending should not be and as we get further into the meat of the word we understand these things so that we can draw closer to him and remove ourselves from following worldly man man-made traditions it is extremely important as you see right here in these scriptures before us he was ready to wipe them out and once you know the truth you are responsible for that truth so as I mentioned before, the covenant, the book of the covenant was first written on parchment by Moses in Exodus 24, 4. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And, and in Exodus 32, we were reading when um, Moses was up on the mount receiving the book of the covenant and all that was shared at the foot of Mount Sinai. And it was being written by the finger of Yahuwah on the stone tablets. So if Yahushua Jesus is our high priest of the Melchizedek order and we are part of his kingdom, what does that make us? And what are our roles after being saved by his grace, by faith? We will study these things out because we are to mature and move from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. So let's look at a few scriptures. And I want to ask you the question, what priesthood are you under? Have you ever thought about it? And how would you answer that question? Believers in Yahushua HaMashiach are under the Melchizedek priesthood with their high priest, Yahushua. Non-believers will fall short on their own accord, whether they try to be good, whether they worship another little g-god other than Yahushua, um, because Romans 3.23 tells us, For all of us have sinned and, and come short of the glory of God. So without the precious blood of the Lamb and without our high priest of the Melchizedek order, we would all fall short. In Hebrews 4.14, Having then a great high priest who hath passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. 
Exodus 19, 5 through 6. This is the beginning part of the Book of the Covenant, which we will delve into more later. But it begins with this. And God is speaking to the people through Moses. He says, Now, then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, which is still pertinent for us today, <laughs> then, when, then, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So, if you will indeed obey my voice, Moses was to tell the people, and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, plural, and a holy nation. So that's in Exodus 19, 5 through 6. So God's original plan, plan A, was his perfect will, which we just read. <laughs> He wanted us to be a kingdom of priests, plural, instead of a kingdom with a priest, singular, as in plan B, which became his permissive will. And in the New Testament, which sometimes is referred to as the Brit Hadashah, we read in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Royal implies kingly. Melchizedek means my king is righteous. Our high priest of the Melchizedek priesthood is both kingly and priestly. We all know Yahushua, Jesus, was born king, and what some may not have realized was that his earthly ministry ushered him in as our high priest of the Melchizedek order for ever and ever. When Peter wrote the above verse in chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he knew that Yahushua had become our high priest of the Melchizedek order from the tribe of Judah, not Levi, and by Yahushua's grace, we can keep his covenant, and if we fall short, we can repent under his blood ratified atonement once and for all. And Revelation 1 verse 6, And has made us kings and priests to God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. In my early believer walk, I could never figure out how was I a priest. <laughs> I mean, I would read that scripture and I would try to figure out how was I a priest. And God, Yahuwah, has now answered my question and what and looking back what an important question that was to ask and study and praise Yah that he has led me to the answer and now I understand it now I get it and in Revelation 5 9 and 10 it says and they sang a new song saying Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Out of an excerpt from Bible Tools, we read about this verse we just read, verse 10 concerns us most. It helps to know that the term kings and priests is better translated as kingdom of priest, as numerous modern translations render it. Christ has appointed the redeemed in verse 9 as a kingdom of priests to serve our God and to bear a measure of rulership. We shall reign on the earth. They are appointed to be I'm sorry, they are appointed to a responsibility by Christ because they, like him, have been prepared 
to render these services in God's behalf. You know, we are Christ's ambassadors. We've read that often. Beyond the priestly functions, rulership is clearly in view for the redeemed. Christ, Yahushua, will appoint only those already prepared for these positions. Both rulership and priestly functions contain shepherding responsibilities. A priest is an individual especially consecrated to the service of a deity as a mediator between the deity and his worshipers. The excerpt goes on to say, We must prepare to lead in the kingdom of God, the world's approach to salvation focuses almost exclusively on being saved by confessing Jesus Christ as Savior. As important as that is, it pays little attention to any other purpose and responsibility attached to it. So throughout this study, I'm trying to bring you bring in different references and resources for um, affirmation and insights. So, and I uh, will leave the links to these um, excerpts as well. Revelation 20 verse 6 in the New Testament reads, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ Yahushua and will reign with him a thousand years. So if you know you are his kingdom of priests, where is the temple now? Well, we know we are temples because his Holy Spirit has come to live in us and through us. So we are the temple. So priests carry out their roles by using their temple to serve Yahweh. In order to do that, we are to be living sacrifices by dying to self and living for him. You know, putting our, our selfish desires aside and letting him live in us and through us. It is no longer we that live, but Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, that lives in us and through us, through the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. Romans 12, 1 reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that's the really the minimal thing we should be doing is each day living for him, not living for us, putting his priorities on top of any uh, priorities that we may want to pursue, be, be in alignment with his will, the will of his Father. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, verses 19 and 20, it reads, Do you not know? That your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, Yahuwah. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God, Yahuwah, with your bodies. That's a very important scripture for today's age. So, again, the priesthoods ran parallel in either an elevated or denigrated position. And that was one of the main points I wanted to make with this presentation before we get into more detail about the Book of the Covenant and the Book of the Law. Setting the groundwork, the foundation, is essential. So know that we will go into this timeline in more and more detail as we proceed. We will understand that our marriage covenant was shared through the Book of the Covenant at the foot of Mount Sinai. We will understand in further detail how the Book of the Covenant was a blood-ratified covenant 
as well as the new covenant confirming gospel message. And with that ushering in of the new covenant confirming gospel message, we know at the time of Pentecost, when the comforter was given, instead of 3,000 dying as it was with the sin of the golden calf, 3,000 were saved. So there will be more videos on this very important topic. And so be sure to share and subscribe. This is going to be a very interesting study. It is very detailed. It does take me quite some time to put these lessons together. I, I try very hard to be accurate and speak accurately. I really prefer to um, fellowship and have a live group because uh, I like to bounce off discussions that way. But this is the next best thing. So blessings to all of you and thank you for joining me. Um, remember Acts 17:11. Always be good Bereans and search scriptures with the Holy Spirit, Yeruah Kakadesh, as your guide to uh, lead us into all truth. So shalom for now. Until next time, uh, I'll see you then. Bye-bye.